So where does an art fair fit into the ecology of creating art, the whole art scene? It seems sometimes very far removed from an artist in his studio wanting to communicate something. I think, I think art fairs for artists are necessary evils. Maybe evils putting it too strongly, but most artists don't think that their work looks best in art fairs. Um, but equally, it's a very good place to get work seen, to expand an audience, to expand your market, and to bring your art to the attention of people who wouldn't necessarily otherwise see it. And that doesn't just mean the members of the general public who are interested, that also can mean curatorial staff or collectors or foundation owners or critics from cultures further afield or places further afield than, than a particular artist's name or reputation or work is known. But I think it's good for galleries in order to try and expand the, 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 the remit of, of, of what they do, which is to develop their artist's reputations, to expand the markets of their artists. But it's very interesting that the distinction is blurred so in so many places across the art world. So Biennales, although they like to behave in an almost pious way, they're begging the commercial sector to fund them. Uh, and, and actually, a lot of the work that's shown in Biennales is, is commercially available. And, yet, and then there's art fairs like this one who are doing large-scale projects here in the pool, outside, out on the harbour. So it, it, it kind of expands. And I think that, that's very interesting, that, that distinction. And even the museums are often having their work, their exhibitions or their programmes funded by the private sector, sometimes by commercial galleries, mm -hmm. sometimes by collectors and so on. So the whole ecology of the art world at the moment is quite naturally a reflection of late free market capitalism. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, an artists, that the best artists not only understand that, but play with that, I think. But if you ask an artist what the most important context in which their, which their work is shown, it's a solo exhibition space that is responsive or clean or neutral or exciting for them in which they control the way in which their art mm. is shown and seen as far as that is possible. And obviously at an art fair you're jostling for attention and certain kinds of work can get lost in an art fair. But you know, there's even a paradox there. Tracy Emin's tiny little bird, the Roman standard, mm. it's dwarfed on our stand. And yet, because of that, people get drawn to it. This poor lost little little creature, this lost little sculpture. So actually even things that get lost, in a sense, can assert themselves in different ways. So good art, I think, can sort of assert itself in an art fair, but it's, it's not the ideal condition. I did see one stand over there where the, the, the display is essentially one huge installation, like a big room with lots of uh, hessian and sacking and stuff around it. Who would you hope to sell that to at an art fair? And why would you present something like that? Let's, th th there's one, let's get rid of one myth. The best galleries, and, and indeed many galleries, at, at an art fair like this, are not just looking to pile stuff high and flog it as quickly as possible to, to, to whoever. That, that's, that's not clever gallery work. Because if you do that in the end, you're, you're going to undermine the, 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 the markets of the, of the artists that you're, you're selling that work to. I mean, you don't know where it's going, you don't know who's going to flip it at auction or what's going to happen to it. So one of the things you're trying to do is, is, is increase the status or recognition of your gallery and promote a kind of ethos of a gallery and also the individual artists that you work with. So actually to do a single installation like that, of course, is in, on one level putting a lot of your commercial eggs in one basket. But the hope, I think, is that a foundation or a museum or a, a large-scale collector may be drawn to a piece like that. But of course, it's also the kind of stand where, I mean, we've done single artist installations, and um, you'll get all sorts of interested people coming to, to look at this because it's more substantial. It's a more substantial presentation of one artist. But then sales can take place elsewhere. There's, there's the, the iPad. There's, there are transparencies. So you, know, you can still use a, a, an ambitious single installation that doesn't seem commercial as a kind of commercial calling card. But I think you know, obviously the best balance is that those kind of installations ideally are placed in significant collections and there's commercial activity that take place off the back of it too. So in that way, is it, is it a bit like, you know, I've talked to fashion designers before who've said, yeah, the clothes in my big autumn collection is ridiculous. We don't expect anybody to wear it. But it is a calling card in the, in the same kind of way. No, not, not quite the same, because, um, because uh, 
the, the more outlandish or radical or uh, uh, seemingly uh, uncommercial a piece is, the more that certain types of visionary collector be become interested in it. Because, in fact, it's it, one, of the, one of the conditions of art of the last 40 years is a kind of a critique of the, the, the commercial rampancy of late free market capitalism. I mean, artists, not naive enough to, to say that they're not part of that and they're not trying to earn a living, but a lot of them have tried to offer a critique of the art object and produce things that, by definition, can't sell, but in fact, people will buy an idea or they'll buy the rights to an idea or they'll buy the instructions as to how to manifest the idea in their own house or in their own collection. Mm -hmm. And um, and so it's the fashion model isn't, isn't the same. It, it, it isn't the same there. It's not a way of putting something outlandish to sell uh, more feasible work. It's just that you can show the range of what an artist does. If you want to show something very ambitious, you can also then show the range of what, uh, what people may see as more commercially viable um, in images. But also, you know, the, the combination ought to be both. This work by Jake and Dino's Chapman, which is called A Little Death Machine, I mean, it's an abject work. I mean, there, there is, there, there's a, 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 a distended a vulva there, there's a severed penis, there's semen, there's maggots, there's a brain having, its, um, uh, having itself smashed to smithereens by a hammer. It's a play on all sorts of things, but the French for orgasm, le petit mot. Um, it's a pretty stomach-churning piece. And actually, it's confrontational. It's seemingly something that most people look at and go, Bleh. but it's also something that certain collectors understand it's kind of, I say cutting edge, it's got a saw in it, yeah. and they want to buy it too. And often, the, the best or the most sought after uh, contemporary work is, is, is confrontational, rigorous, abject, extreme, but also is for various reasons people want to possess it, because it isn't just something cosy and decorative and part of an interior design. In, in an art fair like this, in a Biennale, even in the gallery situation, I know a lot of people are a bit intimidated to walk into commercial galleries because they just think, okay, I'm never going to be able to buy a Damien Hirst, so do I have a right to be here? And do the galleries even want me in here? We and do. That's why we put on museum quality shows. We have, we have spaces in London, in our new galleries in Birmingham, that, Bur Bermondsey rather, sorry, that are bigger than many publicly funded spaces in London and around the country. And we put on shows an Anthony Gormley 100 ton steel single installation that's going to be very difficult to sell, that are flagrantly uncommercial, although there is, of course, this commercial work in the show and this commercial activity that takes place, because our artists want that kind of context and they want, they want people to come and see it. We have 130,000 visitors last year. Anyone can come to White Cube. It's free. We have an auditorium, we have a talks program, we have films. Sorry if this so sounds like a plug, but I'm just trying to yeah. explain to you the lengths that we go to try and get people to come to it. And actually, it's very interesting because Jay Joplin, who you know, who set White Cube up, said that even he, as a sort of well-connected, cultivated young man, felt that commercial galleries in London, there was a kind of usually a, a snooty young girl behind the desk who kind of look up at you, look you up and down, and then sort of, can I help you? And if you didn't seem as if you had the right kind of money or whatever, they had no interest. That's changed. The commercial galleries, I mean, the best commercial galleries want to work with the best artists, and the best artists want their their work to be shown in, 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 to as many people as possible. That's always why the majority of artists will want to work with museums. But museums are often hum hang hamstrung by bureaucracy. They're commercially restrained. And also, they can't always take the risks. You know, the, the artists have to have a certain level of, of public acceptance or that their work has to fit certain moral, social, political conventions. In the commercial world, we're, we're free to do what we want. In that sense, what, what, what the Bristol Museum did with Banksy was quite unusual, particularly for a kind of provincial museum. Yes, yeah, Banksy is a Bristol boy, isn't he? Yeah. But he's an interesting artist because, like the conceptual artists of the last, the, the major conceptual artists of the last forty years, his was an art of protest that seemed uncommercially exploitable. Although books and editions and prints and so on that he was able to produce did earn him a decent living, but actually, people eventually realized that you know, just in the same way that uh, our, 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 a lot of the Western museums have altarpieces and murals taken from ancient buildings, so you can take a Banksy <laughs> off a wall. And actually, it's not that expensive in relation to the amount of money that you um, can get from it. I remember telling a local councillor in Hackney, where White Cube uh, in Hoxton was for a long time, he came to see me and said, look, we have this Banksy on the wall. It, it, well, is there anything I can do with it? And I said, yeah, play the game. It'll cost you about... Ten thousand pounds to get it removed. Take it off and put it to auction. You'll get about a hundred thousand for it. That was a conservative estimate. He got very excited about it, and then was told by his committee 
that they couldn't use public money. They couldn't use £10,000 of public money mm. to take a mural off a wall to put it at auction because that was speculation. And of course, they're kicking themselves. They got, they got sprayed over in the end. I did. I, did say, I, mean, I mean, Banks is an example. He, he, he comes from a very sort of proletariat point of view and, and in fact, an, an anti-privileged point of view in a way in terms of the actual content of the work. But does Don't his you work, believe it? Does his work, <laughs> that's what I mean, does his work get short-circuited by being put in a venue where people feel they need $2 million to walk around? I don't know. It's a good question, actually. Does it get short-circuited? To a certain extent. It, it follows the inevitable pattern that the art market, which is just part of the, 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 the global free market, or free markets, mm -hmm. um, is pretty voracious. And uh, in, in the end, um, unless you really kick hard, it will subsume everything. But he's complicit in all that, and I think that's OK. I mean, in a way, He's subverted the market to a certain extent, and now he's exploiting it, and he wants to, to cash in, and I don't, don't think there's a, a problem with that. But um, uh, there are other graffiti artists who are seen as, uh, amongst graffiti conoscenti, seen as more radical, more interesting, but they're also commercially exploiting what they're yeah. doing. Yeah. I but mean, I'm, I'm not sure that I, you know, th there used to be a distinction, ca a category distinction between high art and low art, mm. high culture and low culture. I don't think we make that anymore. I think one of the things about, of culture, certainly in the West in the last 20 years, is a kind of this melting pot. And the cynic's view is that anything goes, and the optimist's view, or maybe the realist view, is that anything is possible. And, you know, after all, the earliest manifestations of human art are on the wall. It's graffiti. It's what mm -hmm. the cave paintings of Lescow are, in a sense. It's wall drawing, a wall painting. That's what Banksy's doing. I mean, it's part of an, an age old tradition. And that human compulsion to make your mark as well as to take the piss or to subvert. I mean, it's all there in his work. There's fairly traditional motivations to doing that, as well as it seeming to come from a kind of disenfranchised, disaffected youth culture that it, it did 20, 30, 40 years ago. But I mean, actually in, in America, for example, where graffiti seemed to take its strongest hold, it was actually, it was, it was often racially discriminated or alienated groups. It was kids sort of saying, you know, to the system, and this is I make I make my mark. You know, Banksy is a you know a white middle class kid from Bristol, um, who's appropriated that language. But actually, there's no there's, there's no rule that says it has to. It's a, a certain form of art belongs to a particular ethnic grouping, and, and so um, he see it's perfectly. It's, it's perf of course, it's permissible, but it seems it seems perfectly culturally engaged of Banksy to, to play with that kind of form. But there are those who say that you can't be a great graffiti artist unless you come from a certain background. I think that's nonsense. Mm. Are there artists who almost by definition resist their art becoming product? There are those who've tried to do that, but it's, um, I think in the end, that yes, there are, but I think in the end, they will, they'll take fees or commissions or they'll find certain ways to, to, that they have to make a living mm. from doing what they do. Mm. And, um, and I'm not sure that that is, um, is over-contaminating. I think art, it, it's an interesting phrase, it's, it's something that Damien Hirst always says, that it's, it was the best piece of advice he was given, which was, don't make art to chase the money, make money chase the art. Mm. And actually that works across the board. If you're a highly commercially successful artist with a high um, rate of production or a rigorous, low producing conceptual artist with very little product or object, as you, as you might say, to, to produce. It, it, it applies across the board. I kind of feel that in terms of fairs like this, it, it's an example that art is amorphous, that any space you give it, art will find a way to, to get into that. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good way of putting it. Yeah, I mean, I'd call it like a rash. <laughs> spreads everywhere, but I think you're right. I think it is amorphous, well, like, and it, you know, like water, it will seep, seep here, there, and everywhere. You know, it, it, it doesn't. I mean, I've always said that it's the question of whether something's art or not is not an interesting. It's not an interesting question now. I mean, I could produce a doodle on the floor and say it's art because I'm, I'm saying I'm an artist now, and so it's, it's tedious. I mean, that would be a trivial, pointless, completely uninteresting work of art, a gesture. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and my point is that actually it's, it's whether something's good or bad or interesting or whether it has anything to say, whether it moves us, uh, wh whether it has a spark of reverberation in our minds that, that we should be interested in. And it's the same with art in all sorts of different places. 
I love the, I love art's insistence, but even then, you know, the, the quality of a work of art stands or falls by how much it reverberates with the people who, who, who see it or experience it. So, you know, art in odd places is just a starting point. It's another context, but it's still how how resonant and relevant that work is that really matters. If you if you wander around this art fair and you think. Well, I've seen loads of interesting things and I've seen loads of rubbish, but quite what that tells me about the state of the contemporary art world, I can't get my head around. I think that's a pretty reasonable response, um, notwithstanding the fact that you, you know, by definition, are assaulted by you know, masses of objects here. It also actually reinforces the idea, an art fair does, in so, so the same way that a Biennale does, actually, that there's this kind of multiplicity of, of, of production and idea and object. But actually, there are some fairly fundamental things that link much art, an artist's desire to self-expression, an artist's desire to say something about the world, an artist's desire somehow subtly to try and change the way people perceive the world. I mean, they're, they're perpetuals or perennials, really. If artists do things to communicate, does that mean they, they very often will have a very ambivalent attitude towards being collected by a private collector? Because even as a, uh, somebody who has paintings and things in my own house, I notice after a while you don't look at them anymore and nobody else looks at them so have you kind of damaged what, what he was trying to do in the first place there's an artist that I one of the artists that I work with and I really won't say who it is has this phrase oh that's a sofa painting and what he means is it's something that just anyone would buy and hang over their sofa and lose sight and it, it doesn't interest him and this is an artist whose main drive is to do very ambitious scale installations but of course, the smaller scale work has a certain resonance, and that's his way of just being slightly dismissive, but also acknowledging the fact that you can't really have control and you can't obsess too much about where all, where all your art goes. So in a way, it's, a, it's just a necessary pact of selling work. But I think the, the other side of that is that, and this is where good or effective galleries play their best role, is that artists want their work, as much of their work, and certainly the most ambitious of their work, to be seen in the best context. And you're quite right, in a domestic context, invariably it just gets part of the wallpaper. And, and so that's why museums and foundations and public collections still have meaning. But you know, the best collectors can also bring a kind of luster to artists that they respect. You know, if, 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 if a collector has a great collection of, of certain kind of art, artists can also enjoy being seen as part of that context, to be in someone's collection where you're alongside artistic heroes of previous generation or a younger generation that you admire that helps and also the best collectors will always lend their work for exhibitions and retrospectives and so on so uh, um, you know, that can work well yeah. but but really in summary I'll answer your question if you if you if you put a gun to an artist's head and said you know how do you feel about your work being just sort of shoved on someone's wall it's not something they would embrace, but they, they know the inevitability of that. So it's not something you could think about. You can't control it. Their, their duty, they say, or insofar as they have any duty or responsibility, is to produce the work that they feel compelled to do. What happens to it after, afterwards is something they can only have a, a small um, influence on.